Hi, I'm Jacqueline Moroz from Succeed Together's Montclair Literary Festival. Thank you for joining us today for the talk on the book, American Poison. Um, we have a great lineup, so I hope you'll join us for more terrific events today. The festival benefits Succeed Together, a nonprofit based in Montclair that provides free educational services to low-income children in Essex County. If you'd like to support the tutoring and enrichment programming, you can donate via the link in the chat. Today's books are available for purchase through festival partner, Watch on Booksellers. You can click on the button on the bottom of your screen to buy them. All our authors appear for free, so please thank them by buying their books. And if you have a question for today's speakers, you can click on the ask a question bar on the bottom right of your screen. We are fortunate to have as our moderator today, Jim Johnson, a politician, attorney, and community activist who was formerly an assistant secretary of the treasurer and former New Jersey gubernatorial candidate. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you. And I am delighted to be joining with um, Eduardo. Uh, Eduardo Porter is. Thank you. Great. Eduardo Porter is a uh, New York Times um, journalist um, uh, and uh, comes to this story uh, and comes to this work uh, with a sense of passion and conviction. He was born and raised in Phoenix. He also lived in uh, Mexico, uh, started his journalism career in Mexico, and um, uh, uh, ultimately worked for the Wall Street Journal starting in 2000. Uh, covering uh, um, issues of import in Los Angeles, particularly related to the Latinx um, um, community and actually the, um, the many elements of what's considered, what's sometimes called the Latinx community. Um, so, Eduardo, welcome. Hi, um, how are you doing? Uh, this book is fascinating uh, and uh, it is um, so well timed. Uh, how did you come to write the book? This is uh, this may be an accident of timing, uh, coincidence of timing, or basically destiny uh, that this book is has been released um, within the last few months, um, right at the time of racial reckoning in the United States. Yeah, um, yeah. Actually, at first, the, the book came out the same day that New York City went into lockdown for COVID, so. Everything that I had planned around the book suddenly got, you know, canceled. But then, as you know, the, the issues of racial uh, hostility and its consequences and, and, and endemic racism have now been come very much to the fore. But to get to your question about how I came to write this book, I didn't really set out to write a book about race. When I was, you know, thinking, uh, when I started thinking about writing this book, I was, what motivated me was the sense that the United States you know, the most powerful, one of the richest nations on earth had actually managed to build a society that was in fact very, very threadbare, that, that allowed enormous poverty, enormous dysfunction, enormous ill health. And I was wondering myself, well, why, you know? And so the first thought that I had was basically kind of like a list of all the ways in which the United States was sort of like failing its people. Uh, um, and, and, but then I, you know, I, I, I remember the, I, I kind of like eventually I turned around and I said, well, the way to do this story is to, to start with why we built this country, why we built this country this way. And there, it's sort of like I, I drew from my experience coming to live in the United States to work at the Wall Street Journal and the, coming to this realization that race was so embedded in our institutions in a way that I had never experienced in my, you know, in, in, in earlier in life when I was living, you know, in Mexico or Europe or in, in Japan. It was I found it extremely uh, unique, and it, it came to my. And, and, and reading through the literature, uh, it came to my, you know, what what gelled was this idea that in fact it was this these lines of racial hostility, these racial divisions, you know, racism that had actually uh, uh, made us build this, this society with, with such a lack of empathy. And so that's, you know, that's kind of like how I, I started with, with the thought about, gosh, we have really built a, a, a threadbare social contract into, 
oh, the reason why we built this racial, uh, um, this threadbare social contract was because racism really didn't allow the kind of empathy that you need to, to evolve and allow us to build kind of like a more inclusive uh, um, society that, that wor worked for the well-being of everybody. Eduardo, that's really rich. And one of the things that I'd like to, you to talk about a little bit more about the social compact, you say it's threadbare. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit. And then if you can compare what our compact looks like here with what say you've seen in other countries, and then we can dig into you know, why do you think, how, how that it actually worked out at various points when we could actually yeah. have made the compact stronger. Okay. Well, my my background I'm in economics, and so I kind of like my starting point was very data driven. <laughs> and so, you know, if you ask, my first point of comparison would be to just let's go look at outcomes: outcomes for set for health, outcomes for social cohesion, outcomes for all you know, outcomes that measure well-being. And you can go through you know international lists, and the United States is consistently, consistently at the bottom compared to other nations of equivalent, you know, uh, um, wealth. So if you look at life expectancy, in infant mortality, maternal mortality, um, and but all, all others like, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 teen pregnancy, um, um, children living with, with, with single parents, uh, to incarceration rates. I mean, uh, you go across the list, uh, poverty, of course, and the United States is always an outlier always near the bottom of this list. And so, well, then the, the next question is to ask, well, what is different about these other places that, that, that make them, you know, that, 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 that give them these better outcomes? And you, pretty much every other, you know, rich industrialized nation has a more robust uh, safety net to begin with, you know, you know, starting with things like universal health insurance and uh, um, and childcare and more generous unemployment insurance and 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 uh, um, um, training systems to get people unemployed people back to work, but will support them while they're not working. Across these range of policies, you see the United States also as an outlier on the less generous uh, uh, um, end of the scale, and I and. and I, it's it's pretty clear that you know that that this is a that we're talking of cause and effect, and so then the third moment is well, how, how did we come to build it this way when other rich countries decided that it was important to build these more you know robust uh, uh, government uh, apparatus? Uh, why did we choose to build something as 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 kind of fragile and and stingy as it were? And then, well, then you start going back through history and, and how the United States built its its uh, its welfare state. And I, I choose to start this book pretty much in when, with the New Deal, which is when the United States starts really building, uh, um, you know, a, a social safety net. And you start looking that yeah, at every step of the way, um, um, you know, from the, the 30s pretty much all the way through the 60s, most, most of the programs that are created are created in a way that limited them to white Americans, that kept people of color out. And so you, you can see there's a, there's, a, there's a great movement to build these systems that you see in other rich, rich countries, but they're circumscribed to white Americans. And then you have, you know. So that's really important. You were going step by step. Yeah. Um, can you talk about each step of the way where we had choices, and instead of going to what you would call the more, some would call and you would call the more empath empathetic route, the more compassionate route, they went towards the words you used was the stingy route. Um, and if you could take those step by step, so let's build the case that you lay out so beautifully in the book about what those steps are. Let's start in the, in the, in the New Deal. Uh huh. So if, I mean, let me just give you some examples of New Deal policies. I mean, the New Deal is kind of like the great moment of liberal policy making for all these different programs were created, you know, from the Federal Housing Administration that, you know, helped expand home ownership, giving federal guarantees to insure mortgages for Americans of limited means. Uh, you know, the FHA also contributed to the redlining of America. It refused to back uh, to back loans in in predominantly black neighborhoods or for black people, 
And even for in mixed neighborhoods, it really wouldn't lend to build in, in, in for, for, for people to buy, buy, buy homes in, in, in mixed neighborhoods. Um, another example would be the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, which offered um, uh, unskilled young men jobs on government lands. Well, those that had camps that were segregated for, by race. Um, the labor codes in the National Recovery Administration allowed businesses to offer whites a first crack at jobs and allowed lower pay scales for blacks. And 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 or and let's go to the two big crown jewels that come that come out of of the New Deal, uh, of the, the the Fair Labor Standards Act and Social Security. They both excluded domestic and farm jobs, and domestic and farm jobs happened to employ two thirds of workers of color. So all of these programs that are built, you know, the, the, the programs that are built to, you know, help catch people that are in a dire situation, to basically exclude uh, a non-white America. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and sort of like the arc of mystery that, that, that I try to articulate in, in, in Poison is that once people of color had access to a lot of this, you know, the safety net, then the, the political support for the safety net entirely kind of collapsed. So this is, I'm talking about the 1960s, and, you know, when we get the rights act, the voting rights act, basically that invites people of color into the benefits of society, the political support for these kinds of programs, that. So let's, let's pause there. 1964 and 1965, we have the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Um, they get passed. Johnson says, we have lost the South for the next 40 years. Um, and what your argument seems to be is, we didn't just lose the South. You lost the path towards greater expansiveness of, of society and of the social safety. Am I right in capturing that way? You're exactly right. And in fact, Johnson was too optimistic on, on the political ramifications for the Democratic Party because they lost the South for more than 40 years since then. And the South is still uh, uh, pretty much a, a, a solid Republican uh, um, area. But yes, for sure, we, the, the, we lost the support for building the kind of like the set of institutions that would that would hold a country together. Um, that's when we when we started seeing um, um, assistance for for the vulnerable articulated as help for the undeserving. When we started hearing stories about you know welfare queens that you know are abusing your your taxpayer dollars. When you know when that when the argument became about dependency rather than about assistance. Uh, um, and, 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 and you can see that clearly moving through the political system from the 1970s through the present, frankly. And then and, 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 and in tandem, you see this, this kind of like, I would say, complementary rhetoric about, about, about criminality, which is, again, I think a, a complement to this is when you start, our spending on the criminal justice system goes through the roof compared to that of every other country. So it's kind of like the tool that we decided to use to manage society was prison, um, rather than, you know, Healthcare and childcare and those things that are sort of like more popular in other parts of the world. So let's now now maybe we've seen the pivot, right? And then now let's make the case. What was the source? What's the? Let's go to the root cause. Gosh, I'm I'm losing you there, Jim. I didn't hear what you just said. There's. Let's go to the Last year? Oh, now I got you. I hear you. Okay. So let's go to the root cause. Can you take us back to the root cause? But, but the root cause is, is, I mean, just to put it in one word, the root cause is racism. It's racial affinity. It's, it's tribalism. Um, it's uh, the sense that I do not want to pay for a system that is going to help the other. It, it relies on this notion of society divided into groups that do not trust each other, that dislike each other, that fear each other, that hate each other, you know, uh, uh, that feel all sorts of feelings of hostility and, and mistrust for each other. It's very, very hard to build cohesive institutions. And so the, 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 the strength of this 
of this kind of like fundamental feeling has kind of like has has eroded the political support for building this this kind of this kind of uh, of society. So that, I mean, essentially, the book is called American Poison because I'm calling you know racism, racial hostility, this kind of bigotry a poison that 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 has really you know essentially hamstrung our nation and made us less than we could be because it basically it it, it is the I think the the main the the, the main force that contributed to, to build the institutions in the way we did. Um, so take us back to slavery and how does that factor into your argument? Well, I act, you know, I very, I go very little into, in fact, nothing at all into the, into the history of, of slavery. I start pretty much like, you know, in, in, I, I, I start pretty much in the 20th century because that's where we built the modern American state. But to be sure, um, um, the, the, when when uh, um, um, slavery is at the root of why the United States built itself in an us white you know it, it divided itself into a group of people of, of, of white people who ha who held power and people of color who did not. I mean, you could also include in this argument uh, the Native Americans who were also you know kind of like. Uh, uh, shunted off into reservations and considered, you know, like not part of the polity. But essentially, the idea that you know that that slaves were property rather than humans is at the core. It's it's you know it, it's it's at the core of this feeling of uh, of dehumanization that allows that that allows sort of like white power to believe in its own goodwill while building a society that excludes uh, such an such an enormous uh, part of its population. You mentioned that Johnson was optimistic in that he said, said 40 years before we would regain the South. We're clearly not there. But based on our, on your argument and how you've seen the steps proceed from the New Deal on, are you surprised that we are in the circumstances we find ourselves today? I am not. I am not surprised because I don't think that we have done any of the work that might help us overcome these sorts of you know the barriers that i talk about the the, the these and 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 if we don't do any of the work well it's kind of like um it, it's clear to me that we're not going to solve the situation but I, I let me let me think back but I, I, there is something that that does that did sort of surprise me and that has surprised me uh, um, and was part of the motivation to write the book, in fact. I mean, I started, I proposed this book and started thinking about this book and, and, and writing this book in the, uh, in the, in the, in the um, 2016 presidential campaign. And one of the things that motivated me, motivated me there was this being sort of startled by the rhetoric uh, coming from President Trump, then candidate Donald Trump, and how he very overtly deployed uh, um, the theme of racial hostility, very clearly targeted against, against immigrants in his case, and even more specifically against Mexican immigrants. But the, the language of, of racism, of racial hostility, of we need to protect the, ourselves from the other, suddenly became like swept the country like a storm and delivered him the presidency. And that to me was in a way shocking because I thought, well, gosh, uh, we're all, you know in the 21st century, and these sorts of very basic tribal kind of uh, feelings still have this kind of political power. But then at the, at the same time, that sort of said, well, yeah, we really haven't moved on that. I mean, we have this sense of that we've made enormous progress, and in fact, you know, we have become we are richer than we were in the 1960s. Um, we're technologically super advanced, but on this very critical this very, very critical feature that is kind of like stopping us. Uh, um, we've made no progress um, it, because, you know, it, it, you just look out the window at our, at our, at our present politics and, and it's, it's, it's hard to justify any optimism. And then, uh, you know, there are many people who have looked at where we are. Um, if you read um, um, another book that, is, that has been released recently, um, Evil Geniuses, um, that there are, there's blame to be shared, not by, not just in a, it, it, 
we want a bipartisan world in many respects, at least, you know, we used to. Uh, um, but not bipartisan in terms of, of who's responsible. And yet there are many who would argue that Democrats uh, contributed um, post New Deal to the state we're in, um, as well as Republicans. So can you talk about, since we are in a partisan time, what the two parties have contributed uh, to our current state of affairs? Yeah, I, I would say, I, I have two thoughts about that. I would say that today, now, there does seem to be a selection of people uh, uh, of the, uh, by their approach to race into one of two parties. So the, the Republican Party has clearly become gradually the party of aggrieved white Americans who are who are hostile towards the notion of an America that that's going to be majority of color uh, uh, in a matter of a few years. I think that, that the Republicans are becoming more and more a party of that thought. But it's but it's also true that this the, the, the United States, as, as, as we've built it so far, has been a product of both uh, um, um, Republicans and Democrats. So, I mean, just the example that I said of, of, of uh, FDR, you know, perhaps F, I'm not I, I, FDR was not necessarily a racist person, but he actually built a set of institutions that he very well knew were circumscribed by race. And he knew that he and, and his argument is that if I do not bring on board white Southern Democrats in, in the, Democrats in the Senate, which were extremely racist, I'm not going to get my project passed. So he sacrificed, you know, people of color in order to get this project through the political process. But but again, even if you move, you know, further, further, further along, uh, um, you know, President Bill Clinton, uh, you know, which is uh, considered you know, perhaps less so today than than a couple of decades ago, but a, a very successful Democratic president. Well, he gave us like one of the most draconian uh, criminal justice reforms uh, that is, you know, in part responsible for the enormous rate of incarceration of people uh, of color today. He also um, cut welfare reform, buying into this narrative that we needed to shake people off of dependency. And he eliminated, you know, the federal entitlement uh, of, of poor people to federal aid. Uh, which you know, in, in, uh, uh, until until the welfare reform in the '90s, you know, there was a, 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 an entitlement to, to federal aid for for poor people. That's pretty much gone. It was turned into a set of grants to the states. So the the, the Democrats have certainly played in this game, and and perhaps the the, the example that would will become ring most. Uh, uh, perhaps shockingly today, was, I don't know if you guys saw uh, in one of the Democratic debates when Kamala Harris took on a Joe Biden for uh, opposing busing. And to my mind, uh, busing is one of the most successful policy reforms that we've tried in order to try to integrate this country, you know, the idea that we need uh, kids of color and white kids to go to school together, to know each other, to educate themselves together, um, is, is, would be an extremely powerful tool uh, in, in the service of integration. There's, in fact, economic research. There's an economist at, at UC Berkeley called Rucker Johnson who wrote a whole book called Children of the Dream, which actually finds very, very important uh, improvements in outcomes of, of young black kids from the uh, from the the our busing experiment. So and, and yet, you know, it was opposed by white suburban voters. Um, and, you know, the, one of the champions of these white suburban voters was, you know, the Democratic presidential candidate today, Joe Biden. So it, it, the Democrat this this did not play cleanly along party lines. This has been a, a joint a joint effort by Democrats and Republicans. Not to let parties off the hook or anybody off the hook, um, but add to the mix. Um, politicians, and I suppose I'm the last one, um, respond to where the to where the voters are. And what is the current um, the state of affairs, the current popularity of the of um, uh, President Trump? Uh, um, where he's got a durable base around 35 to 40 percent say about this american project and where what we have to do right now yeah well I, it, to me it speaks of this this quite sizable base i mean i hope it's only 35 to 40 and not you know 50 to 60 uh, because he took like more than 60 in 2016 
million, million voters. Um, but that this solid uh, base speaks to me of the power that racial hostility, racial fear still has in our society and how difficult it's going to be to to, to, to do away with it. So it's clear that in, in, in this group, uh, you, you clearly have the selection of, of all the people that are looking into the future of the United States, seeing a country that's going to be majority non-white and freak out because, you know, whites in the United States have always held political power. This is uh, um, going to be perhaps the first time where they're looking at the possibility of losing it. And they're going to try to do as much as possible to stop that from happening. And how do you stop that? Well, you you vote for for candidates that espouse these kind of like uh, um, um, racist views. And, and but, you know, in the political system, you can there are uh, gerrymanders and 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 attempts to supp to suppress the vote of of, of minority voters um, and you know, packing the packing the Supreme Court and other levels of the judicial system. I can I see all those things, um, especially in this administration, as part of a broader project to slow down this demographic change. So I think I, I see it as a very clearly uh, racially motivated uh, um, politics. I see the new, the United States consumed by by racial motivated politics. It's it's not secondary. It's it's front and center. So I want to, before we move to say, think you mentioned before the work that's there to be done, but before we do that, I wanted to level set a little bit. Um, we talked about the impact of racial disparities, of racism, of, of structural racism on um, outcomes. But there was a story that you told me recently about um, conversation you had um, with your son, Mateo, um, about, um, you know, how he felt um, uh, speaking in what is your mother tongue. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was, in fact, that was the day after the 2016 election. Um, you know, I'm Mexican-American. I, I grew up mostly in Mexico. I speak in Spanish to my son, Mateo, who was born in New York, but, you know, I've always spoken to him in Spanish to try to keep his Latino, his Mexican identity alive. Um, and we were, and, and this is the, the day after the, the election, we're on the subway and I'm speaking to him in Spanish like I normally do. And he kind of like starts looking a little worried and he sort of like leans into me a little bit and, and says, you know, that maybe we shouldn't speak Spanish in public anymore. And that made me so angry. Um, uh, the idea that that something like this could shape the view of a you know at the time he was a twelve year old kid, um, and and I you know and I wonder how it shapes the perception of this country from you know black children and Latino children all over all over the United States and. Um, it, it was like, again, it was this thought, wow, we're in the 21st century and we are living with a rhetoric that I would have considered unacceptable, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, you know, and just around on a similar theme, there's a playground near his school around those same days, maybe it was a few days later, you know, and, and this is Brooklyn, okay? This is very liberal part of New York City. There were some swastikas painted on the school equipment. And, you know, a go Trump right under the swastikas. And I was like, where have we come uh, to, to find ourselves? Uh, that came very close. So sorry, Jim's having technical problems. So we're just going to step in for a minute. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm just going to ask some questions that are in the Q&A right now. So okay. one of them is, how did social, the Social Security Act exclude Blacks and people of color? Well, it didn't do it specifically by race. It did it by occupation. So in its first inception, um, it excluded uh, home people that worked in, in households, maids and 
nannies and things like that, and also farm workers. And it just happened that two thirds of uh, African American workers at the time were in one of these two occupations. So it wasn't like written to exclude, but it wasn't written in the bill that this would exclude uh, people of color. But in fact, that is what happened. Right. Uh, we just had a panel on addiction, and one of my questions was. Um, People have talked about the mass incarceration of African Americans for drug, you know, use. But when white people um, are taking opioids, the answer is we need to help them. We need to get them treatment. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah, I see that as you know, a kind of like just another uh, symptom of this all-encompassing disease. And yeah, for sure. But I would say also something that the this this opioid epidemic that is hitting. Um, white communities and poor rural and small town uh, uh, white communities particularly hard is also to my mind pr a an example and proof that this kind of like threadbare America that we've built is also hurting white Americans. So even though lots of these institutions were built out of out of hostility or fears to people of, of people of color, and then, you know, and if you look at infant mortality stats, it is the kids born to poor African American mothers who die most, for mm -hmm. sure. But there is also the vulnerable whites have also suffered this very this unempathetic state that we've built, and you see this notably in the in the opioid epidemic. But to be sure, the reaction to the opioid epidemic, it's well, but these are us. When it was, you know, crack in urban America, um, the white power structure for them it was it was them it wasn't us and so the the response of course was entirely different was let's put them in jail rather than like let's give them treatment. Right, right. Yeah. And, um, similarly, with like you were just talking about the housekeepers and the, the landscapers. Yeah. You know, I know Trump has talked about that, and you know, he's also, I believe, um, hired a lot of undocumented. People yeah, um, Mar-a-Lago. Can you talk about that? That kind of uh, hypo hypocrisy. The, the hypocrisy. Yeah, I mean, in a way, um, um, there's kind of levels to this argument. So, so uh, Jim asked me a moment ago about Kurt Anderson's book. You know, um, 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 who, which, which it, it portrays a nation that was basically taken over by the plutocracy by you know the owners of capital mm -hmm. and um if and and, if, and and i think that where his this book his book and and my book are kind of like relate to each other is he doesn't talk about race and and wh what i would argue that that his that his book needs is missing is that race was the tool or the pr primary tool with which the people of capital, the people of means, the people with control of the of, 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 of greater and greater control of the American econo economy and and political system, used these sorts of arguments in that are that are seeped with racism to actually promote a cause that was um, beneficial to their economic interests. So you know, uh, the chief executive of of of, 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 of the what big Wall Street banks uh, might not fear this hostility against against uh, uh, blacks and Latinos and so forth, but the the they can use the the, the hostility that is in that is amongst white voters to in order to promote policies that mm -hmm. are you know against using tax resources to help vulnerable people and instead to provide tax cuts, and 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 then just to circle back to your original point. Um, um, the, the, the hypocrisy is also because th this comes from two, two different parts of American society. So the, 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 the businesses that take advantage uh, um, of, of uh, undocumented immigrants in the workforce, you know, in the, the, the uh, meatpacking plants in, in mm -hmm. the South and uh, are, um, um, are not, I would, I, I'd say they, they, you know, if they'll go, they'll go to Congress and, and vote for immigration reform and will vote for more, in, you know, would actually like uh, easier immigration laws that allowed more immigrants to come in and for them to hire them more easily. And, the, but, but it, it, it's, it's not, but it's, you know, kind of like that, that's not Trump's base. And so even though the, the, they, they, they do use this Trump, Trump's base, 
it's not essentially the same people. So mm -hmm. if you look at the, you know, the coalition, the last time that that we tried to pass immigration reform, that the U.S. tried to pass immigration reform in 2007, um, there was this coalition of unions, businesses, and then what I would call the cultural group that kind of like has always been opposed to more immigration. So these sort of like three stools. And um, they all came in with different arguments, you know? Business came in because it would be allowed more access to immigrant work. The unions came in because it would because they felt that that legalizing undocumented immigrants would allow them to become to to join unions um, and and that would, that would and then these this uh, the, the other cultural side was the promise that the that the border would be hardened. So I would say that the attitudes in the United States about immigration are kind of like are sort of like divided in this you know in these three sort of like moments that are. There's, there, there's, and, and there is a very sensitive. I, I would put, you know, a lot of strong, uh, a lot of Trump's base in this third group that is just uncomfortable, that you know looks at America and sees that doesn't see the America of 1950, which is the America in which they feel comfortable in, where you know um, um, whites were in a much larger majority of the population and had uh, uh, uncontested uh, control over political power. And um, you were talking about Hispanics, and um, I was just reading about, I think, I believe in Florida, they're, is it majority, um, they're Republican, supporting Republicans? Florida has been at the edge, but yeah, Florida has is, is pretty much a Republican uh, state. Uh, so so I don't know, the thing is that Hispanic, just, just to take a step back, Hispanic is an American construct that really has no real objective meaning. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a bureaucratic designation. Outside of the United States, Hispanics don't exist. Mexicans exist, Guatemalans, Cubans, Colombians. When they come into the US, they all become Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And But that doesn't mean that they're, and yes, of course, they, we all speak Spanish. We share a history of, of, of Spanish colonialism, you know, a, a powerful Catholic church and so forth, but that doesn't make us like the, a cohesive entity. Right, right. And, 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 and so, you know, the Hispanics of Florida until recently were predominantly Cuban Americans, Cubans that left Cuba that fleeing the, the, the Cuban revolution in 59, their politics are ex totally different than the mostly Mexican and Central American Hispanics that live in the West and, you know, in California. Um, and so the, 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 the Mexicans who, who, who are the descendants of, of immigrants uh, um, in California will be much to the left than, uh, than Hispanics in, in Florida. I, I'm gonna ask another question that's in the... Um before Jim comes back on. Um, my understanding the violence in Portland and other cities involved only a small percentage of protesters yet dominated the news. Do you think that democratic politicians are handling the current racism conversation in the best way? How do you think Biden and other Democrats should address this? Well, I, I think that nobody has a good handle on this. Um, I mean, I would agree with your your. It's it's my impression as well that the violence has only come from a small group of people and is not representative of the protest more broadly. Um, but I, I think that the way I think that the, the proof will be in in, in the pudding. Um, right now, what I hear Biden speak about most is about coronavirus, which is where he feels he is more, he has more of an edge over President Trump, and he's not focusing very much on unrest. President Trump is, is speaking about the protest because he thinks he can gain some political traction with suburban voters that might perceive, you know, urban America as out of control, much like in the 1970s, Richard Nixon used a very, very similar uh, approach uh, um, because of, because of uh, um, urban protests happening happening then uh, uh, to drive uh, suburban white voters into the Republican Party. Um, obviously, this what Trump is doing is way worse than what Biden is doing, because tr Trump is using this moment to sow division, um, which is exactly what you don't want to do. But let's sort of see what how Biden comes around to this or how how Biden works uh, um, with with 
um, urban policing um, and urban policing reform and education reform and housing reform to make our cities kind of like more integrated, more truly integrated places. Um, um, and it's it's unclear to me. I wouldn't give him a pass. I mean, it's it's it's. I'm not like, oh yeah, he's going to do a great job. I have I have no certainty about. It. So this is Jim. I'm back in, but but with no no picture. Um, and, and this is I feel one of my favorite movies is Apollo 13, which is all about innovation. <laughs> so I, I have gone through three different systems, and apparently all of them are tired of being video chatted. Uh, so you're gonna you're gonna be you will be the only face that they will see. Okay. Um, one of the big points in your book is about the fact it is empathy and its power and how it could actually drive policy. Um, you know, empathy, many people could hear that and say, "Isn't he just talking kumbaya? Why is empathy different? Um, such a powerful tool, and how does it make?" for a different circumstance, say, overseas um, in other advanced democracies, as opposed to what we see here in the United States? Well, OK, just to, to go to the, the, the conceptual thought, um, I see empathy as a necessary condition. It, it, perhaps it's not a sufficient condition, but is absolutely a necessary condition in the following sense. In order to build institutions that will you know, lend a hand to your neighbor who has fallen into into a bad situation that will, you know, help lift people from poverty that you have not seen. Um, you need to be able to understand these people as, as people, as individuals, as humans that have stories like your story. And so this kind of, th this connection, this, this understanding of each of us as, as, you know, as, as, as humans partnering on, on, on the planet is, I think, absolutely essential to, to build kind of more inclusive institutions. And the way that, that these that tribal divisions, because it's not just race, it's divisions of race or ethnicity, nationality, religion, uh, cultural traits, these, these divisions can be used to weaken this sense of empathy because instead of thinking about others as, as individuals, as people, who you know who suffer like you do and need help like you do, um, you start seeing them as representatives of groups, and a group is kind of like much easier to turn into some abstract menace that's different from you and that's threatening you in some way or that is taking from you, and so I the so that's where I feel that 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 empathy needs to be recovered in order to kind of like build some sort of uh, more of inclusive of truly inclusive institutions. Now, and when you ask about what do I see, how do I see empathy working in Europe? Well, the way that I would, I you know, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any polls about how much Europeans love each other, but but the the argument that I would make, and this is based on um, work by a couple of, of Harvard economists, uh, um, Alberto Alessina and Ed Glazer, who wrote wrote a book about how come the social safety net was so much more generous in Western Europe than it was in the United States. And they found their conclusion was that it, 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 these European nations, when these social safety nets were built, were much more homogeneous in terms of race, in terms of religious experience. Uh, you know, it's the idea, yeah, that, 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 that a Swede paying taxes to provide universal health care to all Swedes is paying taxes to provide universal health care for a bunch of people that looks just like him or herself. You know, one tall Swede, one tall blonde Swede is helping other tall blonde Swedes. The United States has had all this heterogeneity and this heterogeneity, um, which has been in fact also used politically to 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 sow division and, and build power bases um, has made it much more difficult to build these same sorts of institutions. And I find that argument very compelling because there, it's, it's you know, there's this work that I mentioned by Glazer and Alessina, but there's a bunch of other uh, um, research in social science done in the United States um, that kind of shows that racial divisions uh, ethnic divisions get in the way of building things like school systems or even things like uh, uh, sewage, uh, sewage okay. systems. Let's talk, about, let's talk about school systems. And, and one of the points you make in your book is how, um, you know, we talked about the social safety net, uh, but also a big point you make is about 
um, infrastructure, both school systems and say public projects like sewage systems fall into that. How does that play out, this lack of empathy and concern? Well, you know, so let me talk to you, tell me about a, a couple of studies um, that, that um, about this. One of the, one study, I had just moved to LA to write about Latinos for the Wall Street Journal. This was in uh, the, in, about in the year 2000. And one of these studies that really stayed with me and was kind of like a, a belated motivator of, of, of American poison was a study by two economists at the University of California, um, Robert Fairley and Julian Betts, who had, who had looked at what was the response for, from uh, uh, American parents when kids from, uh, in, from immigrant parents uh, from Mexico entered the public school system. And they found like, a, like for something like for every three immigrant kids uh, entering uh, public schools in, in California, uh, one uh, kid of an American born uh, parents would actually leave the public school system altogether and, and move to, to, to a private school instead. Uh, and this is, you know, there's this is there's another piece of research by a very uh, um, uh, famous economist, uh, 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 Jim Paterba, who found that um, um, that that in communities that have old people and and young families, the the old people are very reluctant to provide funding for the education system because it's not their kids, right? They're past that. But what was what struck me was important was if the eth ethnic uh, identity or race of the elderly and the young is different, their support for uh, paying for public education drops particularly precipitously. Um, and so that that is where where I'm I'm, I'm what I'm seeing is 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 lack of empathy in action. It's kind of like the the perception of this other group that is not me, and I don't really want to help it. So I really don't want to put into the public pot because the public pot is going to be used by these other people. And on the, um, the, uh, on the issue of other people, there was a book that came out within the last three years. Robert Putnam wrote it called Our, Our Kids. Mm -hmm. And um, the thrust of the book is that um, white and black working class kids are hurt by the failure to consider all kids are kids. Yeah. Um, like succeed together considers yeah. all kids are kids. Yeah. Um, what is your, um, Putnam had his own views, but what is your sense based on the research that you've done and what you've reflected in your book about how we bridge that empathic, the, the empathetic divide? How do we make um, older folks feel um, and now I'm sliding into that category of, of um, AARP members um, that all kids are actually our kids and it's worth paying the additional taxes to make sure that all kids within this community um, uh, get the support that they need. Yeah, well, yeah. And so just to clarify, uh, um, yeah, is my book is not a very optimistic book. So I'm not brimming with ideas about how to bridge these these um, these issues, and um, you know if you look at right now one of the big trends in in urban and suburban uh, school systems is you are having communities peel their school system you know suburban communities it kind of like separate themselves from the broader school system. Mm -hmm. so, uh, um, so that they can create more homogeneous enclaves that are tend to be richer and whiter than the more you know larger urban, uh, much more diverse and and usually poorer school systems of the cities. So you've seen a bunch of a bunch of cases um, all around the country of these school of you know of white suburbs seceding from the broader school from the broader broader uh, um, school system, and so that's going exactly against what. I think is is the spirit of your question and what I think would be needed. I and, and it brings me back to the idea of busing, and I do think it is very very important. I mean, just take one big step back. I don't think that if you, I don't think that a, 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 a cop would kneel on the head of a guy 
And until that guy's dead, if the, he saw that guy as a person, as a guy, you know, you're at, you're like me, I'm like you, we get headaches, we get depressed, we get happy. I don't think that's possible. And so the is, is how do you see this person as a person? In, and how do you do that? I think has to go through sharing our spaces. And so sharing the public education system, which is where we kind of like learn to be Americans, where, you know, civic thoughts are, are, are uh, we're exposed to, to civic thoughts for the first time uh, um, and we're kind of like build our social intelligence uh, and our cognitive abilities. I think that that is like the place number one. And, 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 and we've tried, we've tried, I mean, I think Brown versus Board of Education was a great decision and the, the, the impulse to, to uh, integrate, to desegregate American education was exactly the right thought. But the problem is that we stopped doing that. Um, you know, we, the movements to integrate kids through busing ran into opposition from suburban, suburbanites. And so we basically stopped them. Um, and now we have, I think, I think we have a school. And, and, and in fact, we've had for, I don't know, maybe 20 years or more, a school system that is in fact resegregating. Now, I don't want to add to the pessimism. I'm, I'm ultimately an optimistic uh, person, but one of the points that you make in your um, in your uh, book um, is that you started with curiosity. And I would think that the work that you have done um, is really um, uh, is a sign of a lot of what we can do, which is you were curious. You wanted to understand why we do and are the way we are. Um, has there been, and this is the last, this will be the last question because we'll need to wrap, but have you been in some way changed and become more open as a result of the work that you've done, which started with your curiosity about why things are the way they are? Because there's lots we can do to study on that. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. Um, I have lived uh, a fairly privileged life. Um, I'm a Latino in the U.S., but I'm, you know, I read white. Um, I go, don't go out on the street. I don't fear the cops. Um, I have uh, a, a good job, a, a stable income. So I, I'm, and, and when I lived in Mexico, I lived also a fairly privileged life in the Mexican context. And so I feel that I've, I've moved through a lot of my life without sufficiently thinking about these things, about, you know, why is it that we've built a nation that allows such inequity, that allows so many bad outcomes and where we seem to, you know, not care or at least not care enough? Um, that was also kind of like a question for myself in a way that, you know, I've got to think about this more and I've got to think about where I'm at in this kind of like system of, of, of opportunity and prosperity and power um, and how do I contribute to to perhaps some of the some of these weaknesses that I'm identifying in the society at large and so it, it's it's not like you know it's not like a great eureka but I do think that I've come out of this with uh, more of an interest in in, in exploring uh, exploring where kind of like the the the, the relative, uh, uh, my relative privilege fits into, into this critical argument that I'm making. Well, that's great. And I know Jackie's coming back on. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, thanks, Jim. Thank you both so much. I apologize for the technical issues we've had today, but still a fantastic talk and really important one. So Thank you, and Eduardo. Thank you so much for bringing your your book here. Um, it's really needed right now. And um, just a reminder: the books are, can be purchased if you click on the uh, green button on the bottom. And uh, we please support our authors by buying their books. I want to also thank our festival sponsors, event partners, uh, volunteers, festival staff. We have a couple more events coming up today. Next, we have politics which should be fascinating, and Chipalooza, 
And uh, tomorrow we have brunch with Adam Platt, and then we're closing with Christina Baker Klein. So I hope you will join us, and thank you so much for coming today.